urban farming. Will urban farming allow city folk to become locavores? This year, worldwide grain production is down because of droughts in Africa and the U.S. Last year, Russia lost 40% of its grain harvest due to drought. Grain yields have flattened in Japan, France, Germany, and the UK, exclaims Lester Brown, founder of the World Watch Institute and the Earth Policy Institute. There are no new technologies to allow farmers to increase yields on land, he continues. Perhaps we should grow in and on buildings instead. That could help city folk become locavores, or people who eat local produce. There are two main problems with eating food that is grown more than 100 miles from an eater. Trust and quality. Through urban farming nonprofit co-ops, city citizens can feed themselves well with food they can trust to be healthy, tasty, and fresh because it's grown close to home. Can we trust profit-driven industrial farms hundreds of miles away? A distance of greater than 100 miles between an eater and the farm where their food is produced contributes to a lack of transparency. Out of sight, out of mind means that industrial farmers can operate with relative impunity. Bill Palastak, community coordinator of Holly Grove Market in New Orleans, inform me that if the distance is further than a day's drive, the farmer is likely not to be visited by any of his eaters. Therefore, city folk must rely on government agencies to inspect food for them. As Michael Pollan vividly described, our profit-driven, industrialized food system is out of balance with the needs of nature, the animals we eat, our own health, and our own nutritional needs. Poland reminds us that if the diet of what we eat eats is unhealthy, because it's formulated on the cheap, then our diet too will be unhealthy. The profit motive is an ineffective regulator because it prefers cheap quantity to quality. This places an enormous responsibility for the health of millions on a few corruptible inspectors with special accommodations at each farm, including their own personal office and own personal bathroom, and an FDA that mostly regulates in favor of large industrial agribusinesses who, like all businesses, value profit over quality. This inspection regime has failed to maintain basic food quality standards. Think of all the nasty things recently found in our food supply post-inspection. E. coli in meat, salmonella in poultry, spinach, peanuts and eggs, melamine in milk, etc. The reports of this failure just keep pouring in. Melamine is an industrial chemical added to milk to fool inspectors by registering misleadingly high protein levels in test readings. Food poisoning cases caused by salmonella have increased by 10% in recent years, despite widespread campaigns to educate consumers and food makers about food preparation and handling. Food scares are happening with increasing frequency. Even outright poisons like dioxins, arsenic, and cyanide have been found in our food. Even if our food wasn't poisoned by industrial agribusinesses, the qualities of taste and nutrition suffer when ripening takes place in transit on a truck rather than on a vine. Large monoculture farms produce little variance in taste. MPK macronutrient chemical farming does not give our food a balanced diet of micronutrients. Corn is not the natural diet of grazing animals. This leads to a lack of nutrition in our food. And don't forget, Ship food also needs preservatives. An eater is more likely to trust a small-scale local farmer that they know over a large-scale industrial farmer hundreds of miles away. To restore trust, the USDA has launched the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food program. 
they are building infrastructure to connect local farmers to food hubs. More farmers markets are popping up everywhere from Paris, France to Seoul, Korea as food security becomes a global concern. Many people have the impulse to cut out all the middlemen between the food and their plate and simply opt to grow their own even when they have no land. In Philadelphia alone there are several commercial farms, urban farms, and renewable rooftop farms, balcony farms, indoor farms, micro farms, and farm to table restaurants. England alone has 59 urban farms. By locating farms in the city, more eaters will be able to inspect for themselves and therefore trust the production of their own food. By now, some of you may be asking, if everyone wanted to eat locally, there wouldn't be enough land to feed everyone near a city. Food would still have to come from far away. Local vores like Pastelac challenge us to eat within 100 miles from home. Now apparently this can be done with conventional farming, but we can exponentially increase our yields closer to home within the city with indoor urban farming. Vertical farms with automated labor will produce a healthy variety well in excess of demand within 100 miles from home. These tall, high-rise buildings with filtered air, floor-to-ceiling windows on every floor and supplemental artificial lighting can regulate environments for plants just as they do for humans today. Just as humans get bit by mosquitoes carrying deadly malaria when they go outside, squash get bit by a fly that inject larvae that bore into the roots and kill the plants. Organic farming is made easier by growing inside. We eliminate the need for pesticides by eliminating pest and disease from the plants environments altogether. Waste streams such as compost and algae treated sewage can be tapped as fertilizer. Thus the dual problem in industrial farming of lost fertility and a waste stream is combined into a single recycling solution. All of the water, even the humidity in the air, is recycled also. Less than one-tenth of the water used in conventional farming is needed. Unbounded by the natural limits of fertility, weather, and pestilence, we can maximize food production per cubic foot to the point where the year-round food demands of 100,000 people can be satisfied in just two city blocks. In a human-controlled environment, humans play the role of nature for their own benefit. Humans taking over nature, some might exclaim? That sounds like Star Trek. It'll never happen in my life. Well, it already has. For a simple example of an automated environment already in use, consider the thermostat. Once set, it automatically runs the air conditioning in your house to achieve an optimal temperature for you to thrive. Open any hydroponics enthusiast magazine and you'll find complete systems that control an environment for any particular plant. Super closet grow cabinets are complete automated turnkey hydro grow boxes that grow up to five times faster and easier, reads one ad. These systems not only water the plants and deliver nutrients, but also mimic the sun with timed lights tuned to specific light spectrum. Some off-the-shelf systems include automatic CO2 regulation. This allows for a sterile and sealed environment, which almost guarantees that there will be neither pestilence nor disease in the crops. Once set in motion, all the grower has to do is wait for harvest. In Singapore, DJ Engineering and Agri-Food and Veterinary Authority have partnered to grow at least five times as many vegetables as conventional farming per acre in a vertical farm. 
In terms of output, we produce probably seven to 10 times more than traditional greenhouses. Critics claim that this technique is too energy intensive. Critics fear that vertical farming may impact nutrition, taste, tradition, and security in a negative way. They even worry about the poor farmer who wants to live outdoors. Growing food has always been an intellectual and scientific challenge. Controlling the taste and nutrition of food grown in vertical farms will depend on good science and experience just as it would on any farm. We will actually have better control of the quality of the food we produce because we will have better control of the environment that that food is produced in. By taking farming indoors, we can leave vast tracts of land to go back to nature. Today's farmers, they can become tomorrow's forest rangers. Freshly picked vine ripened produce is more nutritious and preferred by chefs for taste. In fact, there is a large and growing farm to table restaurant movement across the country. Chefs want the freshest ingredients they can possibly obtain because a chef's livelihood relies on the best tasting food they can possibly create. Chefs like Tom Colicchio at River Park Farm and Restaurant on East 29th Street in New York City believe in this idea so much that they have turned part of their restaurants into gardens. The menu centers around what's in harvest at the moment. These farm to table restaurants produce all of their own herbs and vegetables. Caliccio was harvesting 50 pounds of cucumbers a day at one point. He has 6,000 plants in just 15,000 square feet. not the largest farm in New York City, but we're definitely the most urban. And what I mean by that is that we are surrounded by ultra-urban ultra, ur ultra environment. We're not in, in a warehouse district or in the middle of a park. We are, I mean, look around you. There's buildings, Empire State's right in front of us. We're surrounded by intense urban environment. And the fact that we are the largest farm in New York City that's attached to a restaurant it makes us also unique. Farmers markets are becoming increasingly popular worldwide as citizens attempt to know their farmer and their food. Everywhere from Paris, France to Seoul, Korea has a taste of the country. Chefs who don't have their own garden in the kitchen rely on these farmers markets for the freshest ingredients they can obtain. The Farm and Fisherman in Philadelphia is a restaurant and farmers market and fish market all in one. The freshest fish and produce converge on the plate. Fresh foods don't need preservatives. Taking the profit motive out of food production through public ownership will make it more honest. Public goods are created for a purpose other than profit. Of course, we could let developers into every national park. That would generate a lot of profit and perhaps even create jobs but surely most citizens believe it to be self-evident that in spite of the profits we would all be a little poorer if we gave up our parks not all riches are measured in dollars let's demand that our most fundamental needs of healthy food and clean water be inalienable human rights after all we are all created equal in these basic physical needs let us all share in the responsibility of producing quality food for everyone. We can do this first by educating ourselves and others on how to grow our own food in surplus on our own land, small yard, and on rooftops and hydroponically in our apartments. When enough people are farmers, then we can trade with our neighbors. Next, we should demand that our government hand over abandoned lots and sections of city parks for urban farming even if eminent domain has to be declared for the greater good instead of Walmart. Finally we should create a steady diverse healthy fresh and tasty source of food in excess of demand through technological abundance in the form of automated vertical farms. 
we don't need corruptible government and greedy corporate bureaucrats standing between us and our food supply. Their decisions about how our food should be produced are based on business, not quality. We can trust that our food will be tasty, healthy, and abundant when we become our own farmers and our own FDA. Because of technologically enabled abundance, urban farming is finally allowing city folk to become locavores.